Hello, great to be back again. I'm Rajiv, managing partner at Arise Venture Partners, an early stage VC fund. We've got more than 100 startups and multiple unicorns in our portfolio. Uh, moving to today's discussion, we all know money drives markets today, but with the, but today with the Fed uh, waving the magic wand of tightening liquidity and simultaneously increasing interest rates, the squeeze of liquidity seems to be inexorably leading to a recession. Or is it? This is perhaps the best uh, setup for our guest speaker today, Michael, who specializes in this topic. Michael is the founder of Cross Border Capital, which is an independent investment advisory and macro research firm specialized in monitoring of global liquidity flows. He has been working in the financial markets for 40 plus years. Um, um, you know, big names like Salomon Baring and uh, was a top ranked emerging market strategist by institutional investors for three years prior to setting up a Cross Border Capital. Michael joins us from London today. Um, uh, Today, we'll have a conversation about uh, global liquidity and capital flows in the global financial markets. Um, obviously, Michael has been the top ranked emerging market strategist, so I'm not going to um, I'm going to put you on the chair for what you think about India as well, Michael, uh, in terms of uh, where things are going. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to this event. So I'm going to let Michael take the center stage for about 20 to 30 minutes. Folks, you don't need to make any um, notes because we are happy to make this conversation available after. After this, we'll move to the Q&A discussion. Please type your questions on the chat. We'll Definitely get to them and I look forward to a productive next 60 minutes. So, Michael, over to you. Good, Rajiv. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for listening to this. What I'd like to do is to talk about what I think is the most important factor in financial markets, which is understanding money flows. And basically, if you know where the money is and where it's going, you've got a very good idea about how asset markets are likely to move. And for the last uh, 30 years or so, ever since I was at uh, the American Investment Bank, Salmon Brothers, I've been tracking money flows around the world and using those to understand better asset allocation. Uh, the title of this presentation is When the Facts Change. And the reason behind the, the title is that the facts are changing. It looks as if more liquidity is coming into markets after the sharp squeeze we had in 2022 where, as you will uh, know and probably appreciate, uh, markets had a particularly bad year. Now, um, if we um, move to the, sorry, two, two slides at once. Uh, if we move to the first slide, what that's showing is the picture of global liquidity. And what we're trying to argue here is that global liquidity is a big pool of funds. It's about 170 odd trillion dollars. Uh, it's um, roughly speaking, one and, a, one and two thirds times as big as world GDP. But it's really important because it is measures the capacity of capital in the system. And the reason that that's critical is that there is so much debt that has to be rolled over in the world economy that you need liquidity and you need balance sheet to do that. It's not the cost of capital that's critical, it's the amount of capital, the amount of liquidity that's in the system. And that's what we're tracking. Here is what global liquidity looks like over the long term, uh, starting in 1980. And you can see how much it's grown uh, phenomenally over that period. That is what's driving financial markets, uh, both in the long term, in the medium term, and in particular in the short term. And within that mix, you will see, if you can uh, examine the, uh, the different strata of the chart, that China is becoming a bigger and bigger player uh, in terms of uh, flows of global money. Why is global money so important to asset markets? This chart uh, describes the growth rate of global liquidity shown in orange, measuring the year on year changes. And the black line is the movements in all wealth uh, from the world of or, or world financial assets, but including residential real estate, gold, other precious metals, cryptocurrencies, etc. And what you can see is there's a very, very tight correlation between movements in liquidity, the flow of money, in other words, worldwide, and the gyrations of asset markets. When liquidity goes up, asset markets rise. When liquidity comes down, asset markets fall. What we're projecting in 2023 is a recovery in liquidity because we see central banks starting to push more liquidity into their financial markets. That is not a consensual view, uh, and we understand, but we think that's the reality. And the fact that uh, cryptocurrencies have bounced hugely in the last few weeks, and the fact that uh, asset markets are rising again, 
we think is testimony to this inflection in uh, the liquidity cycle. So as we say, when the facts change, we need to change our view. Our interpretation of 2022 was that the, in the US, the desire of the authorities was to get the Federal Reserve balance sheet down in size and to get the US dollar up. We believe that in 2023 it is the very reverse of that. They want to get the dollar down and they want to get the Federal Reserve balance sheet up again. Liquidity is critical. And that uh, box just below the, uh, that statement is, uh, is uh, words from the Committee on Global Financial Markets from the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements. And what that's saying is uh, emphasizing how important balance sheet and liquidity are for the management of the world economy going forward. Um, that's what central banks are recognizing. And you know, following the debacle in the UK gilt market in September, we believe that inflection was put in in the liquidity cycle where central banks are now putting more cash to work. The conclusion we come to, what I'll try and articulate in the following slides, is that based on rising global liquidity this year, we expect the major stock and bond markets to generally be range bound. But unlike 2022, there are gonna be some areas that show very, very strong absolute gains. Emerging markets are one of those areas we think. We think. And as I say here, the outperformance is really related to the themes of a weaker US dollar, the reopening of the Chinese economy, and stronger commodity markets through this year. Now, let's put this into perspective. And the first thing we want to look at is how the global liquidity cycle moves over the uh, long term. This is a chart showing our data, which goes back to the year 1970 uh, in black, the black line. That shows the gyrations of money flows in the world economy. Um, as you can see, it goes up and it comes down. And that same gyration is the pattern that is replicated in financial and broader asset markets. The red dotted line is a sine wave that we put on top of that, which tries to identify a replicating cycle that tends to last around six uh, to seven years. And that replicating cycle has just seen its trough in terms of the uh, dotted red line. But interestingly enough, the black line, uh, which is uh, the actual data, is following that uh, absolutely. So it would seem, even regardless of the COVID uh, boom and whatever one may call it, the subsequent crash uh, in markets in the last 12 months, it seems as if the cycle is intact. And that cycle is now restarting. And in our view, it's likely to expand now to a new peak around the back end of 2025. In terms of how we invest, let me just uh, share a couple of slides to show our philosophy. Uh, and as Rajiv said, we consult to many institutions worldwide uh, on asset allocation. We manage money ourselves in both fixed income and in equity uh, markets. The cycles that you see uh, on the slide refer to in orange, the liquidity cycle, uh, which is what we've just been looking at. And the red line is the subsequent movement of the world real economy, how the business cycle moves uh, following that. Liquidity is a leading indicator. It tends to be about a year or so in advance of real economies, uh, but it has a meaningful pull on those economies and it's a driving force. And the way that we understand the liquidity cycle to move is there are four phases that we identify that we think of as rebound when the cycle is just picking up from the low uh, to a calm phase for liquidity, uh, uh, a, then a speculative phase, and finally a turbulence phase. Um, you may be uh, reassured or not to know that we've basically just been in the turbulence phase and we're now moving out into, we believe, a rebound phase. The time when you make most money out of financial assets is the calm phase that lies ahead, but uh, we can still make some decent gains uh, in the rebound phase. These are the asset classes that normally perform best in each zone. Uh, as I said, we've been in the lower left, which is the turbulence zone for much of the last 12, 15 months. Uh, that has mean that uh, meant things like cash, dollar cash, 
short dated bonds, defensive growth stocks, managed futures have all performed very well over the last 12 months, but many other asset classes that are not in that bucket have performed badly. The next phase up should be uh, corporate debt, uh, maybe some high yield debt uh, and distressed, but really this is the area that tends to be among the better performers right, uh, right now or, or in the, the coming months. Equities, some equities will do well in that phase, but we think that generally equity market performance is going to be much more about relative uh, gains of different sectors over others. Let me address the US because the US market is important and uh, it's been an interesting market uh, for sure in the last two or three years. What you can see on this chart is the S&P 500, the main index in America, shown in orange. Uh, it's gyrations both through the COVID crisis and subsequently. And the red line tracks the monetary or liquidity injections by the Federal Reserve into the American financial system uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, the tracking between these two indicators is remarkably close. The movement of Federal Reserve money, as you can see, has been going downwards. The dotted line that we've extrapolated is what the Federal Reserve claim it's going to do. Uh, I suspect that they've now deviated from that course. And in our view, if you look very closely at the red line, you'll see that it has hardly moved over the last six months or so. And in fact, if we look in detail at the last quarter, the US Federal Reserve actually injected a net 60 billion uh, into US financial markets. And so what we're really saying here is that uh, in many ways, the Federal Reserve is trying to get its, have its cake and eat it, as we say. Uh, it's trying to portray uh, a vision of being tight in markets, uh, having high interest rates and shrinking its balance sheet, when in reality, at the same time, it is able to inject liquidity into US financial markets. One of the questions is, why is it doing that, which I'll come on to. And the critical answer to that question is explained in this chart here. This chart is measuring the market liquidity in the US Treasury bond market. The US bond, the, particularly the long bond, the 10-year US Treasury bond, is the most important financial instrument anywhere in the world. And what that, what that uh, long bond is basically telling us uh, is that in September of 2022, where you get the low point in the graph, that was when illiquidity in the treasury market was at its low point. There was no liquidity in the market. It was at the time of the UK guilt debacle, and essentially the American authorities panicked at that time because uh, you know, even though there may be a storm in the UK, if there's a storm in America, it is far, far, far more important the global financial markets and the US. And from that point, that low point in September, the Federal Reserve have injected liquidity. And as a result of that, the liquidity in the US Treasury bond has increased significantly. So this chart is measuring market liquidity, market depth, the bid ask spread or whatever in the US Treasury market. And you can see that it's virtually quadrupled or more uh, since that low point. And that has been uh, by virtue of the fact that the Federal Reserve has become more secretly more accommodative. There's been a stealth QE going on. This is the same relationship between the S&P 500 and US liquidity injections that we saw earlier, but in a different form. This is basically showing weekly changes, and you can see the close correlation between those factors. The very fact that Wall Street is, has been rising over recent weeks is testimony to the fact that more liquidity is going into the market. What is the US really planning to do uh, over the next 12 months or so? We think that liquidity will be uh, injected, further liquidity be injected. We think we've seen an inflection point and liquidity will be rising from these lows. Uh, it is not unusual for the Federal Reserve to do this, even though they may be maintaining a rhetoric or a, a view, a vision of telling everybody they're tough uh, and they can keep interest rates high. Interest rates are a lesser factor than the flow of liquidity. Liquidity is all important. And what this graph is telling us is that uh, in blue, 
we show the current cycle in the US of what monetary policy is doing as an index between zero and 100. So the scale of the tightening in 2022 is visible, but you can see that that cycle is beginning to turn up. The orange line on the same graph is exactly the same data, but for the Y2K, 1997 to 1990, sorry, to 1997 to 2003 period. And you can see that it looks as if the Federal Reserve is following exactly the same course uh, that it followed in that cycle. So you would expect 2023 to look remarkably like 2001, uh, 2002, that period. And in that period, you saw a uh, very strong uh, fixed income, particularly uh, corporate bond markets, particularly as the year unfolded, and very strong commodity markets. On the commodity theme, and maybe on the China theme, let me turn to this chart, because this is important. Uh, now, I understand this is not necessarily uh, a huge positive in the Indian economy, because India imports a lot of commodities. But I think you will see that uh, it opens up the possibility of a much stronger business cycle coming forward. The lines on the chart refer to, in orange, Chinese liquidity inflows by the People's Bank of China. The black line, the solid black line, is the CRB Commodity Price Index, uh, CRB being the Commodity Research Bureau of the US. The dotted line is the same index, but without energy prices uh, to show what things like copper or foodstuffs uh, or iron ore or uh, aluminium are doing. The three lines track very closely together. Liquidity is a lead indicator on that cycle. The Chinese uh, tightened liquidity very aggressively uh, through 2022, largely because the Chinese yuan uh, currency came under huge pressure from a strong dollar, and the Chinese were committed uh, to trying to stabilize the yuan, and to do that, the People's Bank ran a very tight monetary policy. What they've been doing uh, since uh, the back end of last year is to inject liquidity. The solid orange line is what they've done in the last two months. December was a big month where they injected 1.6 trillion yuan into Chinese financial markets. Uh, to put that in context, that was uh, approximately four times the amount that injected in the previous five months. Uh, they've added another trillion or so so far in uh, January. So they're continuing that trend. And the dotted line extrapolation suggests that there's more coming if you keep that trend going uh, through the rest of the year. And that should elevate commodity prices further. We've already had quite a sizable jump through this year. So it looks as if the Chinese economy is restarting. That is going to be extremely good news for the Asian region because China is such a large economic footprint. What about the world business cycle? Where are we in the, uh, in the spectrum? The chart in front of you is basically looking at um, world business confidence, which is shown in orange. And this is an aggregation of all the major cycles worldwide. Uh, and the black line is looking at world shipping activity. Uh, so the two pretty much correspond. Uh, there is a sign in the latest data, which is December data, that world shipping activity and business confidence is beginning to lift off the lows. Uh, the point we make by showing this chart is to say that, look, already see where we have come from. Uh, the business cycle has already come down a long, long way from the peak, which on the index was around 90. And you can see that where we are now is just above the 40 level. So already there's been a very significant contraction, um, which markets have, have already digested and discounted. The question is, is how much lower can we go? Possibly we do go a bit lower but we must be nearly through this storm. Um, a further insight into that is to look at a much, much more uh, high frequency take, which is looking at two measures of the daily business cycle. One of those in black is something called a now casting system. A now casting system compares all economic data releases uh, each day with the expected outturn that economists worldwide predict and the black one is showing whether you're getting net positive or net negative surprises 
from those data releases. At the moment, we've got a rising trend in positive data surprises. And the orange line is an AI algorithmic projection uh, based on, computers, on a computer algorithm that basically uses lots of inputs, such as uh, exchange rates of trade-dependent economies, cyclically sensitive commodity prices, uh, corporate credit spreads, uh, to try and understand exactly what world economic growth could be on a daily basis uh, uh, using real-time data. Those two data series more or less overlap. They're completely independent sources or gauges, but they're telling the same story. And you can see really from around October, uh, when the Chinese economy just began to reopen uh, through November and December, that you've got this big pickup coming in world economic activity. So although economists are very downbeat, we're optimistic that we may be somewhere nearer an inflection point than many of those uh, economists would currently suggest. This is another test of that. And those of you that are familiar with uh, the renowned American investor, Stanley Druckermiller, one of the things that he always says is that if you want to predict uh, economies, the best economist is the internals of the stock market. And what we show here is the internals of the US stock market in blue, which is the performance of cyclical companies relative to defensive companies. <clears throat> you can see that has been overlaid on our measure of the world business cycle in orange. And it would strike me that we may be getting an inflection point in the blue line, which will be telling us that economies are close to their low. So that must be a reassuring signal, particularly for emerging markets, which tend to be very economy sensitive. Let me finish on two themes. One of those is what's happening in the fixed income markets. And the other is then what is happening to the American dollar, which I think are two uh, very relevant factors for investment looking forward. This chart is uh, a chart which looks at the US 10-year treasury bond in orange. Uh, the yield is marked on the left-hand axis, and the dotted yellow and orange line is a 200-day moving average uh, across that daily data span. You will see that it seems as if the bond market yield has peaked and it's moving down. Uh, financial markets don't move in straight lines, but generally speaking, we're probably assured that the peak may well be in now, uh, and that looks to be the case. The more disturbing factor, which is a slightly wonkish, uh, perhaps, uh, attribution, is to look at the black line below, which is what is called the term premium. The term premium is the most important concept within the bond markets, um, and it measures the premium or discount in this case that is given or provided to investors in bonds for taking interest rate risk. Now, to interpret that chart uh, in terms of what it's saying as minus 1.6% on the right-hand axis, it's actually saying that if you're an investor in US bonds, you have to pay the market 160 basis points, 1.6 percentage points in other words, to actually take on interest rate risk, which is hugely unusual. Normally you're paid to take interest rate risk, but here you're actually having to pay the market for interest rate risk, which is an anomaly. And that's the hidden cost in buying bonds. Now, if I show you this chart, you'll see what is likely to happen in the bond markets looking forward. The term premium that I've just been speaking about is the orange line now on this chart. And the black line is the other component of the bond market, which is interest rated expectations. And you can read that black line as being what the Federal Reserve is intending to do, or what the market thinks it's intending to do with regard to interest rate policy in terms of Fed funds rates. Now, that figure on the uh, looking across onto the left-hand scale is just above 5%. So investors are expecting US policy rates to end up at about five and a quarter percent. That's probably fair in our estimation. From that point, they may well drop if the economy slows further, but I wouldn't promise, and I wouldn't expect 
a particularly significant drop in rate expectations through this year. So we can say the black line remains elevated. The other component of the bond market is the orange line. And the orange line, the term premia, is at all time lows. Um, the figures that you see there are the lowest recorded since data began in the early 1960s. So we've got, you know, something like 60, almost 65 years of data where what you're looking at is the lowest ever print. And at these levels, the term premium can only really go up. Now, what drives the term premium are number one, the issuance of treasury debt. And we know America has got a lot of treasury debt to issue. It also corresponds to foreign buying or foreign demand for treasuries. Um, foreigners own 30% of the US treasury market. Um, and I would doubt if they're going to buy a lot more in terms of percentage. And of that 30%, about one third is owned by China and Japan. Uh, the Chinese are unlikely to buy a lot more, uh, I would suspect, given the geopolitical outlook. Uh, the Japanese, given what's happening to the Japanese economy, uh, the prospect of interest rates rising in Japan and the strength of the yen would suggest that they're not going to buy a lot of treasuries either. So in other words, that orange line is more likely to rise than fall in the next 12 months. And history tells us it typically mean reverts to zero. So there's a lot of potential upside. If you assume that rate expectations will drop by 50 to 100 basis points at most this year, the black line comes down, I think that orange line will at least come up by that amount. And therefore, my estimation is the bond market, the treasury market in America will be awash this year. In other words, it will just range sideways. There'll be good trading opportunities, but it's largely going to track sideways. Here is the yield curve in America. The yield curve is the spread between the 10-year and the two-year bond. Um, the black line is measuring the yield curve. The orange line is our measure of US liquidity. Liquidity leads the yield curve. If you get an inflection in, um, uh, in liquidity, which we're getting, you would expect within six months that the yield curve begins to steepen. That steepness in the yield curve is normally a bullish sign for equity markets, particularly cyclicals. So in other words, what the bond markets are telling us is entirely consistent with our take so far as to where we are in the business cycle. So in other words, you would expect to see an inflection upwards in the black line, and that would precede the world business cycle, uh, and it would coincide probably with much better equity markets worldwide, but particularly in cyclicals. So to reiterate our view, we expect the broad markets uh, of bonds and broadly of equities to reign sideways with trading opportunities this year. But for a lot of outperformance in certain areas, which is unlike what we saw last year, but outperformance from emerging economies uh, and outperformance from commodity producers and commodity prices as well. Cyclicals should do well. Let me finish with a final word on the US dollar. The US dollar uh, is uh, clearly the key currency worldwide. What matters to the dollar is capital inflow. Uh, that's what drives currencies beyond anything else. Uh, you'll see on the graph in front of you the capital inflow into, the, uh, into US financial assets, into US dollars, in other words. Uh, what that's showing is a very clear step change in the last 10 years. The US has enjoyed a perfect storm in terms of capital inflow. Uh, that capital inflow has been driven by changes in Basel III regulations for banks and solvency II regulations for insurance companies, which mean they have to own more collateral. It's been uh, influenced by the Eurozone banking crisis in 2010 to 2012, which pulled people out of the euro into the dollar. It's been driven by uh, the uh, corruption crackdown in China by Xi Jinping through 2015, 2016, where a lot of money left China and went into, uh, into US dollars. And it's been affected clearly as well by what's been happening in the COVID crisis. So what you can see on the chart is a perfect storm for the dollar. When you have these large inflows, it's likely that you will start to see uh, money moving back out of the dollar. If there's a lot of money in the dollar cyclically, it's likely to come out. This chart is showing where we think the dollar will go. 
This is looking at uh, not just the trade weighted dollar index and DXY, but the real version of that. In other words, with inflation differentials excluded, but that gives you a much purer trend uh, to what's happening in the markets. Um, the trend lines that you see on the graph are trying to identify trends. Uh, from 19, the early 1960s, there was a significant downtrend in the US dollar identified by that broad band. But what you can see more recently, really from the late 90s, is an uptrend channel that we've identified in the graph, which looks as if the dollar in real terms is, is moving higher over the uh, medium term. That can be explained by better productivity figures, figures in the US, maybe a better demographic profile than Europe or China, and maybe because of the America's te technological lead, uh, all suggest that the dollar is in uh, a rising longer term trend. But there are cycles on top of trends that we must take into account. And what you can see is that in the last 12 months, the orange line, which is the real trade weighted dollar, has spiked out of its uh, upward channel uh, beyond the upper uh, dotted line. Uh, it's peaked and it's coming back down. Now, the way that markets work is that these movements tend to be driven by capital flow. Capital seems to be leaving America as we speak and going into other markets. And as that happens, the orange line will come back down well into its channel and maybe test the lower band. And that is uh, representing something like a 20% adjustment downwards in the American dollar. Uh, we think we're around about halfway through that adjustment, so there's more to come. So, you know, in conclusion, uh, you know, what should you be doing in terms of investment? Uh, generally speaking, we are uh, favoring non-dollar currencies. We think emerging market currencies should be robust. Uh, we think that uh, financial markets will be uh, a lot more stable than they were last year, thankfully. Uh, we think that bonds will give a reasonable return, but not a gangbuster or a particularly exciting return. Yields in America will probably be around where they are uh, this time next year, uh, with possibly a little bit of downside in yields, but not much. Uh, equities, we think, are also trading sideways, similar to that. In terms of big markets, it'll be uh, you know trading rallies and sell-offs, whatever, through the year. But certain areas will perform very strongly. And I cited, again, emerging markets, China, uh, commodity prices, commodity producers, et cetera. Uh, within that, the ranking you see, if you can, uh, if your eyesight is as keen uh, as that, you can probably identify uh, different market areas. Uh, the orange bars are stacked in terms of where investors currently have their greatest risk exposure and where they have least. Being uh, contrarian investors, we like to invest where others are not investing, and therefore we uh, we like the lower part of that graph. Uh, you'll see that there's a number of markets that are quite interesting on that. Uh, the U.S. is actually not that far uh, away from the lower areas, about the middle, as is India. China looks very well placed. A lot of the, uh, of the neighboring Asian markets are in that zone, too, as are commodity uh, producers like Brazil, South Africa. Uh, but it's really some of the more stable demand European markets that you see towards the top of the graph. That's what we, we're not so keen on. Cyclical markets like Germany could be quite good, but uh, you know, that's broadly uh, the picture that we're, that we're in. So uh, that's, uh, I think, the, uh, the sort of essence of what we're saying. Uh, what I can do is to conclude at that point and maybe hand it back to Rajiv to see what questions you've got and how best I can uh, attempt to answer those. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Michael. I think that was fascinating. I think it's a great start to the new year because uh, this is amongst the most upbeat presentations I've heard in a long while, particularly given all the uh, predictions of recession that have been happening over the last uh, few months. So maybe what we will do is get started with that particular question. Uh, your charts themselves uh, have this yield curve inversion in play. The two to 10 year uh, you know, treasury seems to be in the negative 50 basis point mark. And that sort of historically has always you know, sort of indicated that there is a, you know, a fall coming. There's a fall in industrial activity coming down the line. Um, are you saying that that's not going to happen? Because obviously, if the liquidity cycle is going to rise up, obviously we are sort of you know the soft landing element seems to be in play. What's your what's your sense of where we are? Is there a recession or isn't there? 
Well, I think they, I think there are there are maybe three three angles to take on that. The first is that we've already had a huge drop in business activity, as I tried to show in an earlier chart, which I'll go back to. You've got to bear in mind that look where we started uh, at the back end of 2021. Uh, that business confidence index was up in the 80s, right? Uh, we're currently down in the low 40s. So in terms of just a pure metric, we more than halved in terms of business confidence. That's a very significant plunge. That doesn't say it can't go lower, and it probably will go lower in the coming months. But our view is that you'll likely see an inflection in business activity and business confidence probably within the next three to six months. Um, you know, say before um, you know, midsummer, that should occur. Um, same with shipping activity. Shipping activity is going to be slightly more, uh, more leading, uh, perhaps, because China is a very big part of world trade, and the China reopening will have a very significant effect. So uh, shipping East also has dropped a lot, but that may all be inflicting early. So I think, number one, you've got to bear in mind that we've had a lot of adjustment already, but the markets have clearly... Uh, told us about, but economists have been late in the game of sort of catching up with. So uh, that's one of the things to bear in mind. The Fantastic. second thing, sorry. I think, to, sorry, just to, to bring in another point about the yield curve is this, and that is that the yield curve is shown uh, in black. You're absolutely right to say that it's inverted. Uh, it is. But there's another factor to take into account uh, in terms of the inversion of the yield curve. One is to ask how good a predictor it is, and the answer is it's not bad, but it's not brilliant. And I wrote a paper in a uh, slightly wonkish paper in uh, a journal called the Journal of Fixed Income about uh, four or five years ago, which looked in detail at the efficacy of the yield curve as a predictor of economies. And the conclusion, the academic conclusion was that it wasn't really very good uh, if you just look at one particular spread. If you looked at the 10 2 year spread, you'd be right sometimes and wrong an awful lot. Uh, at other times, the three-year, one-year spread or the 10-year, three-month spread or the 10-year, five-year spread work better. And choosing which one of those yield curves works is, is an art in itself. But what above all is distorting the yield curve right now is the other thing I spoke about, which is this, the orange line, the term premium. If you've got hugely negative term premium, of 160 basis points, what you should be doing strictly is adding that 1.6% back to the yield curve. So on that basis, the yield curve wouldn't be anything like as inverted as it is now. And the question is, is that term premium telling us anything about economies, or is it more likely telling us about the lack of collateral in the world financial system? And I think it's more the latter. So I would tend to discount uh, the yield curve as a brilliant fail-safe indicator. Got it. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. You know that was a very erudite explanation. Uh, the next question, really. So I think last year was perhaps one of the few years when the sixty forty portfolio didn't work at all, right? And you know, essentially, the viewpoint there, um, you know, in simple language, as I understand it, is basically that you got risk in equities and you got you know risk aversion in bonds. And when you know risk falls, obviously, you have to have a rise in risk averse assets. So these two sort of you know sort of balance each other out. And that was the first year I think in a very long time, and that didn't work. Perhaps. Um, you know, um, you know, and um, and uh, your slide seventeen also sort of seems to be showing a head and shoulders pattern on the on the on the yields per se. So that looks like the bonds are headed towards um, you know you know lower yields. That means the bond prices are likely to go up now. Does that mean that the the you know the sixty forty is going to start working again? You know, what's what's your sense of this? You said it's sort of going horizontal as well. So what's your sense of this? Well, I think I think the 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 question is is that. The 60-40 is really referring to, uh, let's say, uh, safe assets versus risk assets. So 60% in risk assets, 40% in safe assets. I think that's, uh, that mix is one that's set in stone for everybody. The question really is, what is a risk asset and what is a safe asset? And that's where the debate comes. So are fixed income uh, going forward a safe asset or a risk asset? And I would suggest that looking forward, a lot of fixed income are risk assets. Now, if you're a pension fund, uh, a regulated pension fund, or a regulated insurance company, or a regulated bank, 
You don't have any choice in that decision because the governments are telling you that those are statutory risk assets, sorry, safe assets that you have to hold. So you've got no choice. But if you're a, a retail investor, you have that luxury of choice. And I would suggest that Japan is the canary in the coal mine, if you understand that expression. But what you've seen in Japan uh, is what we all uh, will have to live with in the future. Japan is a leading indicator of everything, whether that be negative interest rates, whether that be QE, whether that be uh, disinflation, whether it be demographic issues, uh, et cetera. And Japan has just been through a period of yield curve control where they're trying to, they're trying to manage yields and push yields at very low levels. Now, uh, to invest in the Japanese bond market is a nightmare because you can make lots of money and you can lose lots of money. And the JGB, the Japanese government bond, is a very, very risky asset indeed. So uh, going forward, I would say government fixed income is not the place I'd like to invest in. But I still want to have 40% uh, of my portfolio in safe assets. So what I would look at is to spread the risk into other forms of safe assets. And that may be things like uh, market neutral hedge funds. Uh, it may be hold more cash. Uh, it may be to buy defensive growth stocks, etc. But I wouldn't be wanting to put a lot of money to work in uh, in government bonds because I don't trust governments. <laughs> a good one. And that leads us to the next question, which I'm sure is a, a question that you've always been asked uh, in the recent past, at least, Michael. What actually happened uh, during the list trusts, um, you know, sort of, you know, that two, three week period when uh, uh, all the pension funds in the UK basically said, you know, uh, give this up or else uh, we're sort of uh, going belly up. If you could sort of help us understand that, because obviously what should have happened at that point in time is bond uh, uh, yield should have risen. I mean, uh, you know, so what happened then? If you could sort of help us understand. Yeah, there's a, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated question, but let, let me try and uh, answer it as in the most straightforward way I can. The first error that was made was that the Bank of England did not raise interest rates when the market expected it to. Uh, I think that was in the beginning of September. And they decided not to raise interest rates, which was an extremely foolish thing to do. So the markets were on uh, hair triggers, if you like, uh, not preparing really to give the UK the benefit of the doubt. Uh, in that uh, in that period. And then you've got the budget statement, which basically said, uh, we're just going to spend money without any, uh, you know, without any concern about whether we're going to fund it easily or not, or whether the tax revenue is there, etc. Now, there may well have been, <laughs> somewhere in that decision, some logic, uh, in the sense that they felt that if they gave the UK economy a sufficient boost, after what had been years of austerity, and I think the austerity policy was wrong, by the way, so to move to something which was more pro-growth made sense. But the problem was they didn't do the arithmetic properly. And so the markets got spooked by a combination of the lack of interest rate rise and the fact that there was no proper fiscal discipline and the UK guilt market sold off. Now, the external implications of that, as I've tried to uh, uh, underscore, were huge. And the US Treasury in particular, I think, got spooked or very frightened by that. And that's why we've seen this stealth QE in America ever since, to try and underpin the US Treasury market, because that's so important. Internally in the UK, there was a problem. And there was a problem because the way the pension system had evolved in the UK, and this is not dissimilar from many other economies, uh, but the UK, because it's got a fairly advanced uh, pension management system uh, was actually further down the road in this than others. The UK had devised a system whereby, um, as you may know, and please stop me if this is becoming too detailed, uh, many, uh, many pension plans in industry or corporate pension plans were underfunded in the sense that their liabilities to pensioners were greater than the assets they held. And therefore, uh, <clears throat> they faced the problem of either having to make cash payments into the fund, which was unattractive for the corporations, or what they needed to do was to basically run a higher risk mix in the pension fund by having more equities, and therefore they could meet their obligations or liabilities in maybe 10 years' time. And that's the route they chose. Now, to square that with the authorities, the authorities said, 
you can do it providing you duration match um, your portfolios. That may be a, a, a too technical term. And what it means is to have sufficient uh, fixed income uh, exposure that you basically uh, will match uh, potential movements in interest rates on both liabilities and assets. And the way that the institutions, the pension funds got that exposure was by using off the shelf products that were provided by companies like Legal and General, uh, which were very leveraged uh, exposures to the bond markets. Those products had um, uh, in their terms, uh, the need for collateral. In other words, that if the market sold off, you would have to post more collateral because it was leveraged. And that collateral was either more government bonds or more cash. Now, what they said in the small print was that the institutions may have, I believe, up to 90 days to give that collateral. What they had was something like nine hours uh, in reality. And so they had to find collateral very quickly to post against the volatility. And they basically used their existing gilts. So they sold their gilts, their government bonds, did post cash collateral. And that caused the market to spiral out of control. So it was all very technical, but that's what happened. And therefore, the Bank of England came in to give support to the market. The one big margin call then, right? So Huge margin call that the Bank of England largely <laughs> provided. Uh, absolutely. Let's now switch over to the most interesting part for this audience, definitely. So it looks like what you're predicting is that India is going to you know, sort of shoot through the roof, um, um, if not, if it were not for the commodity boom, per se, which obviously is going to be a dampener for us. The dollar outflows are clearly you know, positive. Emerging markets are positive. You know, Global liquidity cycles are moving in the right direction. Um, obviously, there are some factors for India that sort of work well as well. But um, is that, um, uh, is that uh, fairly true? I mean, is it, uh, is it just India or is it going to be the entire basket? of emerging markets that you see as uh, sort of sort of moving quite uh, quite aggressively. I think I think one's got to be realistic and say, look, uh, it, it's it's going to be all emerging markets that should benefit. Uh, you know, I've been covering emerging markets for a long time. Um, the last few years have not been very good, but that's really because you've had a combination of three things going on. You've had a strong dollar, which, as we said, has been almost a decade long non feature. A strong dollar is very negative for emerging economies. Secondly, you've had commodity prices which have been up and have been down, uh, but they haven't really had a strong trend. Uh, but that cycle now is going with emerging markets. And thirdly, really since 2015, you've had a very lackluster Chinese economy. Um, and the Chinese you know, boosted their economy hugely in 2008, but they haven't really done very much since then. But they are doing it again now. So unusually, perhaps, or fortunately, uh, you've got those three drivers all coming together this year. Strong China, strong commodities, weaker dollar. That's good for emerging markets. Cyclical emerging markets like China, Brazil, uh, commodity producers like South Africa as well, should do very well. India, I would suspect, will not outperform the emerging market universe this year because India tends to be more of a stable demand um, contributor. It'll still be a good performer, make no mistake. But I think you might get stronger performance in more cyclical markets, particularly those that have had a very rough 2022. India's had a good 2022 because it tends to be quite a defensive market. On a medium term view, uh, I mean, I, I'm invested personally in India because I, I believe the story wholeheartedly. But I think if you with geopolitical changes underway, uh, the Indian economy has to be uh, monetized and strengthened economically. Uh, you know, for the uh, ambitions of America and the West vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. So I believe that India is going to be, uh, is going to fulfill uh, its true potential in the next decade or so. So I'm very upbeat about the Indian economy uh, and the Indian market. But I would just hesitate to say that in 2022, it may not be the star performer in the emerging market universe, largely because it was last year and things don't necessarily carry through. Uh, but emerging markets generally, yes, definitely invest. 
So uh, thank you so much. That was uh, very sweet. I mean, base effects are going to make sure that India is not an amazing performance uh, at this year. I think, uh, you know, I think the commodity prices, as you said, are going to sort of have a bit of a dampener because we don't produce too many commodities, anything. Everything we have to do, we have to buy from outside. So I think that's one thing. Which sort of brings me to the question about the dollar. You had a very strong viewpoint of the dollar and you said, uh, don't look at the DXY, look at, uh, you know, the dollar real uh, trade weighted index, right? So the DXY itself has sort of been going down, right? Since uh, it hit the 114s, 115s. It's now, a, you know, sort of stuck at 102 right now. Uh, what do you think, you know, what do you think is leading to this outflow? I mean, is it, um, where is this uh, coming from? Well, I think it's, uh, I think there's there's a number of reasons, Rajiv, why, why this is going on. I think one of them is that investors are beginning to realize that uh, the Federal Reserve is adding liquidity. And if the Federal Reserve supplies more liquidity, what you are likely to get is um, uh, with more supply is a weaker dollar that normally happens. Um, other economies, notably Japan, uh, it's been argued uh, will push uh, interest rates up more. So the interest rate differential between uh, the US and Japan will close and that will make the carry trade of uh, borrowing in yen and investing in dollars a lot, lot less attractive. And that's what we're already seeing. So I think you've got those phenomena going on. And then I think the other thing is that, of course, you've got to remember that the dollar is always a safe haven. So in times of great uncertainty uh, and potential economic recession, people go into the safety of the US dollar. That always happens. And when you get an economic expansion in the world economy, people move away from the safety of the US and the safe haven qualities of the dollar and take more risk. So the dollar is a, a safe asset. Um, and probably what I'm arguing in essence is that if central banks are adding liquidity, we need rather less safety now and more risk taking. And on that basis, the dollar should come down. And maybe a third point, as the previous chart says, you know, what goes up often comes down. There's been a huge, huge inflow into the dollar, which have been exceptional factors, which have created a perfect storm. And it can only largely come down from here. But, you know, the long term trend looks good. It's just all we're saying is that spike uh, upwards may take us down to the lower end of that channel, but that's still maybe another 10% adjustment from here. Got it. So more like a mean reversion is what I think you're thinking about. Right. Uh, one last question. I think uh, this question had to do with, uh, you know, uh, look, for a very long time, America has led the world's economic. So it's like America sort of sneezes and the rest of the world catches a cold, sort of has been the adage that uh, the world has sort of followed on, which is basically a tightly coupled um, sort of economy globally, which has been led by America, right? For the first time, I think at least the first uh, few weeks of uh, at least this year, you know, you know, we have seen, uh, you know, the story of China, de <laughs> China's uh, reopening, sort of driving global markets to a frenzy that I don't think we've seen in a very long time. And this is despite American numbers not showing um, you know amazingly good uh, good good uh, good uh, good impetus to the upside so what do you think are the prospects for the fact that uh, there'll be other engines that will sort of wake up to global growth apart from america this year is that still something that it's is it like a fusion uh, in nuclear which is sort of still 30 years away or uh, do you think that that could be a potential prospect for this year well i think that you know there's, there's, there's a lot of talk clearly uh, in geopolitical circles about the rivalry between China and America, and what does it mean? Does it mean the dollar is eclipsed? Does it mean the Chinese yuan will uh, get a boost? I think that it, it's a that that's a very difficult question. Um, what the, there are maybe two observations that I'll draw on that, uh, which have a bearing. Uh, a lot of these thoughts uh, actually I wrote up in a book uh, which was published in 2020 called Capital Wars, which is published by Macmillan, uh, and that really addressed a lot of these issues about global liquidity, the importance of global liquidity the role of China and what it means for the dollar and the Chinese yuan going forward. <clears throat> the observations are these. The first thing is that what you've seen uh, across the Asian and Central Asian regions in the last five years is a proliferation of swap deals between the Chinese People's Bank and regional central banks. Uh, in other words, those regional central banks have access to yuan swap lines. What is the reason for that? Why are they there? The only possible reason that you could fathom is because China at some stage in the near future is gonna re-denominate a lot of trade into Chinese Yuan. Uh, that may start or it may include oil, but that's gonna happen more and more. 
And China, it, it, you know, as we often say in the West, that you know, China it, it takes a very, very long-term view. I mean, it will take a view of centuries where we tend to think in years or decades. And China's making that movement now, <clears throat> but it wants to re-denominate trade into Chinese yuan. So that's point number one. It's going to happen, right? The second point is that if you look at the macroeconomics of currencies, it is extremely difficult to displace the dollar, uh, not just in the world economy, but also specifically in the Asian economies. And the reason for that is that uh, America runs a large trade deficit, not because America is uncompetitive, but because America has hugely competitive financial markets. And if you're running trade surpluses, so for example, if you're uh, China uh, or OPEC, uh, the Middle East, you're running big tra trade surpluses, where are you going to put that surplus? The only place you can put it into is a big savings market, a big financial market, and America is the only market. Now, if China is going to suddenly uh, come forward with a huge financial market that foreigners can invest in tomorrow, then I'll come quietly and say that there's a good chance of the yuan displacing the dollar. But that's not going to happen. China's financial markets, as my book Capital Wars explains, are very rudimentary. They're nothing like as sophisticated as American financial markets, and they won't get there for decades. And so the fact is that the yuan may be, it may re-denominate trade and the yuan may be more important, but there's no way that the dollar is going to be eclipsed overnight. It would take time. Uh, and therefore, you're going to be running two parallel currencies, major currencies in portfolios uh, over the foreseeable future, but the dollar will still be the dominant one. Uh, that's that's a great point, and that's definitely held uh, very true over the last few years, Michael. But my question to you is, thanks to what America did with Russian uh, reserves uh, beginning of the last year, and what China is obviously already jittery about, given it's whatever 1.2, 1.3 trillion dollar position in uh, U.S. denominated bonds. Don't you think that there is a switch away from that, you know, the warehouse being American uh, bonds to, you know, other things like gold? One of the reasons why gold seems to have risen in the last uh, month and a half seems to be because of that. I mean, don't you think there is a switch away from that? Obviously, there's no big market that can hold that kind of money. Even gold market is only about 11 yeah. trillion or so. Uh, uh, isn't I, I there, aren't there other markets? Commodities, for yeah. instance? Well, I, I agree, but the but the liquidity in these other markets it is just not large enough to take the size of the surpluses that we're talking about. So, as you as you pointed out yourself, Reddy, that you know the gold market is important, and the Chinese will buy more gold. There's no question about that. The Russians will buy gold. That's all they can do. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of treasuries uh, around the world buy gold. Gold is going to go up. Gold is an asset we like this year. It's a monetary phenomenon. Gold is, remember, is not a hedge against inflation. It's a hedge against monetary inflation, which is different. And if central banks are expanding, gold will go up. The Chinese are buying. That will push it up. There's no question. But the market's not big enough to absorb the size of these surpluses. Uh, they could put it into commodities. But you know, where do you warehouse all these commodities? Again, that's a problem. At the end of the day, uh, the US provides a very convenient uh, solution to a lot of countries which is basically to provide treasuries. Now, what I'm not saying is that the Chinese will increase their exposure to treasuries beyond uh, the percentage that they've currently got, uh, but they may well in absolute terms buy more treasuries. That, that's, that's a possibility. Uh, where else can they put it? Well, they can put it into FDI, foreign direct investment, and they can start investing in Central Asia. But the question is, I mean, the arithmetic of all this is that surely that's gonna be supplied by Chinese companies and that would mean that at the same time they do an FDI investment, they get a, a bigger trade surplus. So you're back to square one. So at the end of the day, what they've got to do is to invest in financial instruments or uh, other assets that other people, that sorry, the Chinese don't, uh, don't produce themselves. And that's either US dollars or it's commodities like gold or it's oil. Uh, but, you know, the scope, you're scratching around for things to think of. And maybe euros, I mean, that's a possibility, but then that's probably why the Americans want to get Europe on side. Fabulous. I think that was a great, uh, great explanation, Michael. I, I think, you know, the dollar still stands strong and tall. Uh, don't bet against it, I think is, um, you know, one of the last words really at this point in time. Thank you so much for such a fabulous session. Really enjoyed it. And, great uh, pleasure. Uh, for for folks that want to reach you, Michael, what would be the best way to reach you? Uh, our website's crossbordercapital.com. I've got a uh, Twitter handle, uh, which is cross-border cap. 
There's always lots of things on Twitter where we uh, we talk about markets and developments, um, or you can look find us on LinkedIn as well. Um, so there's a lot of different avenues, but the website crossbordercapital.com is a good one. Uh, we produce research, we manage money, and if you're into this sort of uh, stuff about global liquidity, uh, you know, please read my book called Capital Rules. Thank you so much. We'll obviously put a link to the book on the um, notes um, on, on our social media circles as well. Thank you so much, Michael. Really appreciate it. And I uh, look forward to the next session, hopefully face-to-face -face when you're in India next.